everybody. Um, we're in open session here now. Um, we've uh, okay. So um, we have full attendance, so we have no apologies. Um, okay. I want to refer members to the memo on the circuit, page 29, regarding a, a visit by the uh, the Lords EU Committee to Parliament Buildings for a series of meetings on Tuesday, 25th of February. Uh, they had requested to meet the committee members for a working lunch from 1 to 2.30 p.m. And they have since clarified the lunch invitation is for uh, two to three uh, committee members. Um, are members content for the chairperson and deputy chairperson to attend the working lunch? Yep. Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also an invitation to all committee members to attend a business roundtable discussion on the practicalities of the protocol. Members are requested to uh, talk if you wish to attend the roundtable discussion. I think the uh, I think the presentation from Shana a while ago sort of made provoke a few questions. Um, I want to note that the the that I want you to also note that myself, uh, the deputy chair myself, had a, an informal meeting last Thursday with the TB Eradication Partnership on their position on bovine TB, and the group consists of Sean Hogan, Seamus O'Kane, who's retired vet, David Ray, a farmer, and vet Adrian Patterson, also a farmer, and Dr. Sam Strain of Animal Health Ireland. Papers from the meeting have been included on their correspondence at page 452 in your packs, and the making, meeting focused on the recommendation for some of um, some version of a badger call followed in due course by a vaccination programme. And the eradication of bovine TV is a, a big issue for the department. I expect that the minister will make a decision on the way forward in due course, and I think this issue is significant importance that the committee may wish to hear directly from the group in due course as time allows. Is, is members content that the session be organised as time allows? Yep. I want to advise members that, that it had been planned to issue new tablet devices for electronic committee packs on Monday, the 17th of February, but this has now been deferred. Members will be informed of the new date once this has been finalised given uh, and, and given the individual time to collect them from the IT. So I want to just go back to the uh, draft minutes. Um, Page 31 to 37 in your packs from Thursday the 6th of February. Um, are you okay for the minutes? Yeah. Can you attend? Thank you. That's it. Okay. And any matters arising from the minutes? No. Okay. Okay, item six now in the agenda, uh, we will have uh, an oral briefing from the Central Service of Contingency Planning Group, um, and this will include a budget briefing. I want to note that the officials will be covering two areas. The first will be in the matter of the 2019-20 budget and looking forward to the 2021 budget. The spring supplementary estimates will also be covered. The second area being covered is the remit for the Central Service of Contingency Planning Group. The officials will give a short presentation on both before I open for questions. And uh, m members will be allowed to ask questions on the budget and on the remit of the group. And the departmental papers for this session can be found on your packs at page 40 to 49, uh, 60, sorry, 40 to 59, 60 to 72, and 73 to 88. And the clerk has also provided a short briefing note on these two issues, which can be found at pages 3 to 5 and 6 to 8 of the table papers. Which are here today. Okay, so um, and followed. You can ask. Uh, you can you can um, seek uh, quest, big questions. So um, I also want members to note that the finance committee have also requested the copies of our budget briefing papers be forwarded to to it as per memo of page four fifty one of the pack. Uh, can I get agreement to forward the financial information to the finance committee. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay, so, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Brian, Sean and Roger here today, and um, I invite you to brief the committee. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, firstly, can I thank the committee for the opportunity to provide an overview of the work of Central Services and the Contingency Planning Group. Joined today, as Chair has already mentioned, by Roger Downey. Roger is the Department's Finance Director, and Sean McGrady, who is the Director of Corporate Services. Uh, I'm aware that the Committee received a briefing document on my group, and I hope that you find that informative. Chair, so if you're content, I propose to provide a high-level overview of the group's uh, business activities, and then Roger 
uh, he was actually due to appear here before the committee next week uh, on the budget. We'll do a presentation, uh, which was included in my briefing pack. DERA, as you're probably all aware, is a very diverse department, impacting on the lives of every citizen in Northern Ireland every day. We have over 3,000 staff and over 70 locations delivering high-quality income-focused services. Central Services and Contingency Planning uh, is one of five groups within DERA. Uh, we have 360 staff providing in the main corporate and support services to the wider department. There are six direct uh, directorates within the group, corporate services, digital services, finance, staff engagement and leadership, and two Brexit contingency divisions. Mm -hmm. Corporate services led by Sean has a, a wide range of remit and, among other things, is responsible for the Minister's private office, the Assembly section, sponsorship of five arms length bodies, human resource related activity, the press office, equality, diversity, and public appointments. With regard to the arms length bodies, we are working to secure closure to a range of governance issues, including a number of public appointments. And in the coming weeks, we'll be engaging with the arms length bodies on the business planning for 2020 21. In terms of equality and diversity, the Department has demonstrated year-in-year -year compliance with its statutory equality duties by submitting an annual progress report to the Equality Commission. The progress report for 2019-20 will be submitted to the Equality Commission for scrutiny at the end of the summer, and I would be happy to return to the committee to brief you on this. <clears throat> In addition, we have established an equality and diversity steering group as a subcommittee of the departmental board, which is chaired by the Permanent Secretary. And this is seen by the Equality Commission as an exemplar of strong leadership in, uh, in relation to equality duties. Corporate Services Division also provides support to the departmental board and its associated subcommittees to assist the board in exercising its responsibilities. Digital Services Division, in conjunction with a number of partners, provides information and IT mm -hmm. support and development services across the department and is leading the department's digital transformation programme, along with information security and access. The division plays a leading role in ensuring our customers can access services through a digital platform accurately and in a timely fashion. The division has had considerable success and is on track to achieve its target of moving 125,000 transactions annually from paper to digital platforms by 2020 and move 150,000 transactions annually from telephony the digital platforms by 2021. This aligns DERA with the wider NICS ambition set out in the strategy for digital transformation of public services between 2017 and 2021. In terms of staff engagement and leadership, that division is taking forward DERA's people strategy and works across the department to build staff capacity and capability. This includes an extensive leadership and development programme and mentoring for over 150 staff. As a result of our focus on our people, the NICS People Survey in 2019 shows an increase in employee engagement for DERA of 58 per cent against an Northern Ireland Civil Service score of 51 per cent, and this is a very significant achievement. The two Brexit divisions were established as temporary measures when the Department was preparing for a no-deal Brexit. Work is ongoing to refocus these teams and priorities in light of the EU Withdrawal Act and the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. And finally, before I hand over to Roger, Finance Division, uh, it plays an integral role in delivering the Department's strategic outcomes. Their focus revolves around the five key themes of strategy, financial management, value for money, performance and corporate compliance. Um, can I also just say, uh, Chair, if you wouldn't mind, in the briefing note that I provided to the committee, you may have noticed at the top there were three figures around resource and DI and capital. Um, those figures weren't uh, accurate at the time of which they were submitted. Uh, so just for completeness and accuracy point of view, the resourcing figure was 47.2 million instead of 47.3. The DI was, uh, should have been 16.4 million instead of 4.3, and the capital should have been 36.9 million and 20, instead of 22.6. And apologies that those figures weren't correct when they were put to you. So that's a, a fairly high level overview of the work of the group. So following Roger's presentation on the budget position, we will be happy to take questions. Okay, good morning. Um, I propose to go through the presentation that you should have in your packs, page by page, and highlight uh, some key figures in each of them. It's uh, page 60 of your packs, member. Page 60.
Uh, the slides are in two parts. Uh, the first part covering uh, the final budgets for the current year, 2019-20, and then our proposals under budget 2020-21. to So starting with the first slide there, uh, you can see our final budgets for this year, split into the three uh, budgetary categories, resource 206.2 million, uh, resource depreciation impairment, which is non-cash, of 24.6 million, and then our capital budget of 81.7. And uh, it's important to note that the table underneath is our Brexit budgets, and these aren't baselined. So that was additional money we've got this year that doesn't roll over. Um, so we'll have to bid for that uh, as part of the, the budget exercise for next year. Over the page, then that breaks down those budgets into the five main groups in the department. And you can see on resource there that uh, Veterinary Service and Animal Health has the highest on resource. And the figures for Brian's group, uh, which he just clarified a moment ago, uh, are in the bottom row. The next slide then breaks down the resource budget into the main expenditure categories. Um, and immediately you can see at the top there that the salary and wages are the biggest cost in the department at £125 million. Uh, on NDPB funding, AFBE as our largest NDP, has the largest budget in it, of which uh, just over 21 million is staff within that 32 million. And if you add that 21 million for staff to the core department, we have staff of about 146 million, which is around 71% of the department's budget. So the main part of this, the department's budget, is, is on staff. On the programme side, uh, we've got the Rural Development Programme, and that's uh, the match funding in there at 7.4 million. TB compensation is uh, projected to be 18.9 this year, and at the very bottom, we're projecting to uh, generate almost 52 million of receipts. For the page, it sets out at a high level our capital budget for the year uh, across the five main categories. Um, uh, that we classify them, and uh, the largest there is on our, our programmes, which includes the RDP. And uh, the next one there is research and development. And since 1617, uh, Treasury changed the classification of research and development, and it now scores in capital. So staff costs and running costs in AFB that uh, are involved and meet a, a strict criteria for research and development uh, now score in capital. So, uh, because we're at this stage of the year, January monitoring has been concluded, um, and we declared some reduced requirements in that exercise of 12 million resource, 1.6 million uh, resource DI, and there's actually a typo there in the capital, it was 4 million that uh, we declared. And the outcome of this monitoring round uh, sets the final budget for the year, and our focus now is on spending out that budget and meeting our business plan target of between 99 and 100%. So the next stage is uh, the spring supplementary estimates process, and uh, this provides legal authority for the departments to spend the budget and cash approved by ministers in the monitoring rounds. So uh, members be aware that the main estimates process uh, usually is at the beginning of the year and gives the legal authority for the opening budgets, and then as the monitoring rounds uh, take place during the year, there's adjustments to that, and the spring supplementary estimates then get the legal authority for the final budgets. Um, and uh, the resource and capital budgets that I've just, just discussed in the previous tables, they are then split across various functions in the spring supplementary estimates, and they're set out in detail in the separate pack that I've given you. And these support the budget bill, which is due to be debated uh, later this month. So that's uh, this year's funding, and if we turn over the page, uh, we start looking at uh, next year. And uh, a big element that we're having to focus on for next year is EU replacement funding. And uh, they're the funding streams that we got from the EU in the past that need to be replaced going forward. And the largest one there you can see is, is the CAP Pillar 1 funding, 293 million. And uh, this has been confirmed by Treasury uh, for this year and the other elements uh, will be firmed up as part of the, the budget exercise. Over the page takes a breakdown um, of our resource bids. Uh, 
first one there is the Brexit staff costs, which I mentioned at the outset is not baseline, so you have to bid for it. We've got the large EU replacement funding that I've just mentioned, and then we've got a number of inescapable pressures. Uh, pay inflation in there, um, because 71% of our, our budgets and staff. Uh, we've got Tripsy in there as well, the tackling rural poverty and social isolation. Uh, 1.8 million of it was funded by Confidence and Supply in the past two years, uh, so we have to bid for it. And then we've got a 3 million bid in there for the strategic environment programmes. And over the page, we've got our capital budgets, again split out on the five categories, with the largest in there uh, on our programmes. And if you turn over the page again, this breaks them down into the, the different elements. And on programmes there, uh, the RDP is the largest. Uh, we then have the Farm Business Improvement Scheme and Waste Recycling. And on the IT system side, digital transformation is the largest element in there. And then over the page, we have AFBI, Research and Development. And finally, Recurring Capital. Uh, there's various bids across our estate uh, for building improvements and replacement plant vehicles and machinery. And there's also a bid in there for uh, the AFBI Research Vessel. And then, finally, uh, when the executive came back, uh, the New Decade, New Approach document uh, was published, and DOF asked us for uh, bids the department would like to make for uh, any references to actions that relate to this department. So we identified three bids in relation to climate change, um, around staff taking that forward, scoping the creation of a, an independent protection agency, and for taking, undertaking a LIDAR survey of the Northern Ireland coastline, um, as well as some projects to tackle marine plastic pollution and some further research and development. That's a high-level overview of our final budgets for this year and our proposals for next year. As I said, there's a separate pack on the spring supplementary estimates, and I'm, I'm not proposing to go through it in any detail, but I'm happy to take any questions on it and uh, any uh, the studies have just gone through. Um, thank you. A number of members taking the question, uh, ask questions. Um, can I ask um, um, Big Brian? Um, see, in relation to uh, the uh, protocol for here, the implementation of the protocol, and we had a very informative briefing just a while ago from Shauna, um, made reference to increased regulatory checks on certain goods entering the north from, from Britain. Um, what assessment have we done to identify what goods might be subject to these checks? And, you know, how certain is it that such checks will, will be required and where and when it would happen? You've probably caught me, Chair, completely out of my depth in this one, um, uh, and I am not in a position to answer that question, probably more into Robert Huey, uh -huh. um, who does the SPS checks uh, on it. Um, I think the, the protocol, we're still trying to fully understand what the implications are going to be for Northern Ireland and trade, whether it be with the EU or from a, an East-West point of view from GBT ourselves and vice versa. Um, uh, what we have been doing is a little bit of scoping work in terms of what the volumes of of checks could potentially be if we were receiving goods into from GB into Northern Ireland, but that is still very much fluid, so I wouldn't be in a position to provide any commentary on that. Um, but ha happy to take that away. But I know that Robert, I think, is due to appear before the committee. If he's not already appeared, um, I think he not would yet. be he'd be in a better position to to answer the question than I would. See then, um, Roger, in relation to the um, the, uh, the the budget, I noted in the report that there was twelve million uh, of the resource was surrendered. Um, what? What? Why? Why was that the case? Uh, there was a, a number of elements uh, for those reduced requirements on resource. Uh, the largest was two point nine million in relation to EU exit funding. So we, we got that around September time, uh, and, and there was no deal preparations uh, for an exit on the 31st of October. Because that didn't happen, there was a number of things that would have happened, didn't need to happen, so we were able to surrender that back to uh, the centre. 
uh, TB compensation is also down on last year's 1.6 million in it that we didn't need. Um, but because the nature of the disease, you don't know until late in the year just, just um, <coughs> what it's likely to land at the end of the year. Uh, there was also some savings that uh, we were trying to generate in preparation for next year, and there was 1.2 million uh, given back in it. And then the rest are, um, I suppose, a number of, of one-off easements. We got additional income um, from Forest Service of uh, 0.9 million in timber receipts, and that, that moves up and down each year. Um, there was also extra income came in on the regulatory side in NIEA, and uh, we uh, we were fortunate that uh, there was no uh, disallowance required on our uh, European schemes this year, so there was 1.4 million we were able to release on it. A number of these things don't don't play out until late in the year. So that's why um, they were given at that stage. Okay. Well, listen, um, I'll pass around to some of the members. Philip, you're, you're indicated first. Sure. I have a couple of questions. That can be more than a couple. <laughs> Just in terms of the 7.5 million allocated for rural broadband, I mean, I'm, I'm making the assumption that's the department's contribution to Project Stratum. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Well, that was an easy one. Uh, the, there's uh, no point. Let's get the figure here. Uh, no point nine directed towards remediation at uh, Maboy. Uh, if I could maybe have a wee bit of detail in terms of what that remediation is. Uh, also, the, I mean, the EU funding, obviously we've got a commitment that uh, the EU funding uh, is, uh, is safe for this year. At what point during the next year's process then will uh, usually engage in to secure funding uh, going long term into the next year? Uh, because, I mean, obviously 310 million is a huge uh, uh, block of funding for the economy here in the north, and I mean it's money that we, we can't do without. Uh, so that's another point. And then the climate change aspect in the budget, uh, I see that uh, you, you have got two million resource and one million capital for additional staff. Just a wee bit more detail in terms of the remit of the staff, how many staff, uh, and then what the capital cost is. And I, mean, I, I take it that's staff working towards producing a climate change. Climate Act, basically. Just me. So, <clears throat> I think between Roger and I, we'll do our best to, to pick up on all of those. In terms of the of Maboy and the remediation, there have been a couple of stages to the work that has been ongoing. So, there was a business case that was approved that went through the Department of Finance in terms of preparatory work, taking us to a point. The actual large remediation will be subject to a further business case. So, the expenditure that has been incurred, I suppose, is more around preparing ourselves for what will happen. In the future, this is going to be a very significant piece of work. So it's a relatively small amount of money, and what the overall cost is going to be. So it's not as if there's been a, a lot of remediation on the site. It's on, on the site that's around getting surveys done. So a lot of the preparatory work that we need to do in, in terms of what we will do with Maboy going forward. Um, the EU funding um, will it'll be subject to normal bidding process for us. So I think, as Roger has already said, we've got the two hundred and ninety-three million pounds guaranteed from Treasury this year, and there is a guarantee through to uh, 2022 um, around that funding continuing to come across. But I think we received around about 95 per cent of the, the 295 million. Yes, well, yeah. yes we guarantee we'll get that in, in 2021. So, so they didn't give us the absolute amount, they gave us this 95 per cent of it, and then we will bid further, um, because that was based on historical um, requirements uh, for us. So we will continue to bid through the normal bidding process to be able to secure that money from Treasury. Okay. Uh, and then in terms of the climate change two million, um, I'm not across the detail of what, what what exactly was involved in terms of the cost of that. Uh, well, in terms of that, uh, the, the staff is in the region of, and it, I suppose it's initial scoping at this stage because the, the document was only it came out in January, so it's between 30 and 40 staff, and. To, to take out, to take forward, just new climate change legislation, associated policies and stra policies and strategies, uh, and then also the scoping study for the, the creation of the new agency. Um, uh, but there's also some money in there to take forward this the light detection and changing survey as well on the Northern Ireland coastline. So, uh, and, and this isn't an allocation yet. This is just a bit but we've put in. So. Um, they're put in along with our other bids, and they go into uh, 
with the bids um, from all departments for the executive to decide um, how much of the pot comes to each department. So this is this is this is what we currently project we will need in the next. Okay. 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 Uh, just before we move on to the next, uh, uh, <coughs> just Philip had raised about the project stratum and the department, um, 7.5 million towards it. Um, obviously, I uh, declare my giftlessness given the fact that the area I'm from, from an Oma district, is the worst in these islands in terms of uh, uh, access to fast broadband. What, uh, if you have any measures in place with the Department of Economy to make sure that it actually targets the most uh, areas most in need of uh, broadband? Uh, well, I suppose the Department for the Economy is is the lead on it. Yeah. Um, I think it's 150 million yeah. is the is the uh, the total amount. Uh, because of our remit uh, in rural affairs, we were asked to make a contribution, and uh, we we've we've put in bids for seven and a half million, and we've indicated seven and a half million for subsequent years as well. Um, actually, since we've put in these bids, we've we've heard that uh, this money uh, might be needed. In 2021, due to delays in the, the tender process on on the DFE side, so while well, I suppose that was factually correct when we put the bid in, it might it might not be needed now because they've enough or I suppose they're they're bidding as well for it part of the budget exercise, so they don't need a contribution uh, from us in the first year, but we will be putting money towards them in latter years. Well, but is there is there um, protocol in place or? Assurances in place that it will, that if it does be used in subsequent years, that it will target. You know, do you have a? Does it, this department have, you know, like a say or, or an input into the shape of the project stratum? Um, well, I suppose uh, Paul Donnelly um, on the rural affairs side, the director of rural affairs, he, he liaises closely with uh, his colleagues in DFE. I'm not sure if there's a, a detailed protocol in place because it's I suppose it's still early days on it. But I know that they work closely and they feed back to us whenever there's um, a, an exercise to put bids into to DOF. Uh, he's on the phone to say make sure we we get this in. So uh, I know he works closely with them and, and keeps us informed. I'm going to move on swiftly here to William. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. I was going to ask a question in around TV, would you answer that one? But in relation to Capri, I see building improvements 5.7 million. Do you know what the, that is for, do you? Uh, it's for next year. Um, uh, I suppose it's building improvements and PVM, which is plant vehicle and machinery. So it's, uh, I suppose it's, it's vehicles, it's machinery, um, there'll be some kit in there. There's always, uh, Caffrey's quite a, a wide estate at, at Greenmount yeah. and Lockery and Enniskillen, so there's always, um, I suppose, smaller sheds or projects like that. There's a, there's a number of small projects uh, that constantly, you know, that they refresh on a, on a year-to-year basis. So I, I don't have a list of all the specific ones, but, just, but I know they, they, they send through a list. Sizable sum. Well, I suppose again, that's that's uh, the bidding process. The, the we've bids in there of 124 million in total. This year, capital budget's 80, 81 million. So we're not expecting to get 124, but we'd like to get somewhere between the two. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, yeah. So, so Caffrey, uh, it's, it's unlikely they'll get the full 5.7. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, William John. Um, chairperson, uh, I think we focus m mostly on what money you're going to spend, but you also actually earn some money, uh, particularly in research and development. How is that going? Uh, because there was a report produced by the Audit Office which seemed to suggest that your debt collection hasn't been particularly successful. Uh, yes, uh, that's in relation to the royalty income. Yes. Uh, on, on, on the AFB side. Uh, Yes, the, in the 18-19 uh, accounts, uh, they had uh, income put in for, for royalty income, and uh, there's a, I suppose this arrangement was put in place uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, and it's coming to the end of that. Um, and uh, I suppose the uh, AFB are still, you know, they've done the work, they've sent, you know, they've sold the vaccines, they're due to get the royalties back on it. Um, they just they haven't got it in yet, and they're going through a uh, process with uh, the legal on the legal side to to try and uh, bring that to a conclusion. So, uh, as far as AFP is concerned, they're still aiming to to, to bring that in. Chairperson, I, I welcome that undertaking, because you know you are 
government department was over 800 employees, and there are serious pressures. And we cannot afford the embarrassment of money that I believe is rightly due to you, outstanding. I think it's an absolute disgrace. Um, but we are looking for a couple of additional, or some additional staff <coughs> for climate change. Now, I know this is running into another government department, uh, which perhaps deals more with more than plastic bottles. Coastal erosion, serious issue on the uh, oil estuary and McGilligan Point and across the Cosby Coast. Uh, what is your role in that, if any? Uh, I think uh, coastal erosion may be more to do with, with rivers agency in terms of uh, the capital infrastructure. Um, I know uh, we've put a bit in here to do the, the LIDAR survey on the Northern Ireland coastline, so that will help inform what, what works need to be done on the back of that. But uh, um, there, unless it was around the ports um, and uh, where NIFA have responsibility, then uh, I'm not sure if there's uh, a remit for this department in, 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 in other more general coastal well, areas. Well, Chairperson, I believe the very fact that you have addressed this and you're going to do some work on it, I hope is useful and will inspire uh, some government departments to take action because our coastal line is in serious difficulties, notwithstanding all the plastic that's in the water. But the, the sheer need for, for maintenance uh, and uh, up, upkeep. Uh, finally, uh, is the Environment Department sufficiently resourced to ensure that we never again have another Mayboy? <coughs> well, my understanding is that there are a number of sites across Northern Ireland um, probably upwards of I think over 400 where there has been illegal um, dumping um, and we do have our enforcement officers who are out regularly um, trying to ensure that they're both identified and then action is taken. Um, my boy and as somebody who lives in the northwest and actually lives quite close to that particular site um, there's no doubt that it is a, it's, a ter it's, a, it's terrible what has, has happened and as you will also appreciate it's currently subject to a legal case and I wouldn't wish to say too much more. Um, but I would hope that the actions that we do take and the legislative powers that we have will ensure that we can take action both to prevent and also then whenever we determine to take forward through legal prosecution. Well, again, Chairperson, that's a yes for me <coughs> because it's critically important that all sites, including those that are licensed and operating legal, are remain within the remit and the regulations because I think it would be unfair to you now that you've told me you live near this. I feel sorry for you. Uh, no community should be expected to live near something that's uh, anything but of the highest standard. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Blair. Thank you, Chair, and can I thank the officials as well for, for the information we've received so far. I have a few questions, Chair, which I'll just go through. None of them, none of them are lengthy questions. Um, the, the report's uh, budget shows that the Brexit costs have increased from around 12 to around 24 million. Um, can I ask if that's solely related to increased staff costs in preparation for the processes ahead? Can I ask on digital transformation if the department have, across the board as it were, a target for the increase in digitalised services available to the public? Is there profiled a an expected cost savings going forward? Digitalisation will bring on climate change. Can I ask if the department fills in the prospect and potential that is out there to include the voluntary resource which exists to assist um, in our voluntary and community sector and people who are already working very willingly and, and very well on these issues across? Northern Ireland, and also and finally um, on estates, which are listed here in the budgets, um, uh, with with some detail. Can I ask if there's a strategy across the department to examine unused, underutilised surplus requirements in the estate overall, 
and if any income is expected from that. But, but essentially the question is, is there a strategy to examine this now? Or is there or should there be a strategy to continually review the state's provision? And especially in relation to underused or unused facilities. Okay, so again, probably between Roger and myself, we'll try and answer um, all of those questions. In, in terms of the, the Brexit expenditure that we've incurred to date and going forward, it has been staff costs. Staffing, yeah. um, although I should point out that none of that is actually funded. Um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, we, we've put our bids into the Department of Finance saying this is the expenditure we anticipate or this is the expenditure that we have incurred and we go from year to year. So that has been staff costs uh, and currently we have uh, 253 staff who are actually Brexit staff uh, working across the department. Sorry, how many? 253. Um, and, and we believe that we need around 454 staff. So there's a, a continuous um, process by which to secure those staff, both within government and also some external advertising, because there are specialist posts um, that we can provide uh, from within the department. Uh, in terms of digital transformation, uh, uh, as I indicated earlier on, we do have targets. There are targets for the NICS for those 125,000 transactions in terms of paper and then the 150,000 transactions going from telephony to digital. So they in, are in DERA. In DERA. Yeah, there are targets specifically as part of a, a wider uh, transformation programme across the NICS. And I think they're, they are designed uh, to do two things. One is, yes, to generate a cost saving but also to improve the services that customers have, which is a, a financial benefit as well. And I think you only have to, to look at the uh, uptake there has been in terms of basic payment applications. We're now 100% online. And I think that, the, well, I know the feedback that we have received from customers largely is, is very positive uh, because they're able to process applications, as in the customer is uh, much quicker and access the information online. So there are set targets for us to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> your climate change question, um, uh, there is nothing that we could deliver within our department that could not be done without uh, assistance from our partners, whether that be those that we contract or particularly in the voluntary and community sector, they're hugely important to us. Um, at this early stage, the two million that Roger has referred to is very much about scoping what we're going to do within the climate change agenda, but I have absolutely no doubt that that will include involving uh, our partners across the piece. Um, I can't sit here and say that includes funding for those organisations. I think until we actually scope out what the work is going to be, only then will we be in a position to know what partners we're going to be able to link in with. But I would be surprised if we didn't seek to provide some sort of funding um, across the board for our partner organisations. And then finally, just on the estate side, and I'll maybe just touch on this, Chair, very, very briefly, because I know you're due to have a presentation from Fiona McCandless. Um, and Fiona is actually responsible for estates transformation. However, I think as you've pointed out, um, we will have an estates strategy um, for the department, but it will link in to work the Strategic Investment Board is currently undertaking looking at the wider NICS estate. <clears throat> and uh, again, I wouldn't like to say what that would include, but we need to maximise the estate that we have across government. In DERA, <coughs> excuse me, we're already in 70 locations. Um, as uh, you may know, we have a relatively new building in the northwest in, in Ballycally, um, and that we anticipate that that will actually be filled very shortly um, with over 400 staff. Um, I think there will be a wider question for the Department of Finance who actually lead on estates on whether estates will be sold or not, or any of the estate will be sold to generate income. Um, so maybe a, a broader question for them. But um, I will make sure that Fiona is aware of your interest and that when they arrive here that they'll have a more detailed answer for you on that. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Morris? Thank you very much, Chair. You have a, a bid here, uh, thanks for your presentation, but you have, a, you have a bid here for a research vessel. Is that a replacement for the, uh, <coughs> the, the vessel that sank in Loch Boyle in 2015? <coughs> uh, no, that's, so the, is a different one. that's, a, that's the Loch Agency vessel yeah. that sank yeah. in 2015. Yeah. This vessel is for AFBI, their research vessel. Um, uh, there, uh, AFBI had been working with counterparts um, in the Republic to determine if we could have shared a vessel, um, but that didn't materialise into to anything, uh, and that's why the cost has been put in, uh, specifically of herself. So it's a research vessel for AFBI. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. The, other, the other vessel, though, sorry, just to yeah. interject, the other vessel is being considered as well by the LOX agency in terms of options that it has to 
carry out the work that their vessel of which sank uh, previously did and uh, you know one of the options would be uh, some kind of replacement vessel but there are lots of other options that are being considered as well okay thank you very much of course. okay thank you, yeah. thank you. Of course. Thank you. Um, under your capital budget, um, you have programmes at £31.7 million. Can you give me a bit of a breakdown as to what these are? Uh, yes. Uh, the largest elements is on the, the rural development programme side uh, with LEADER at £12.9 million. Uh, there's then rural tourism at £2.6 million. Environmental farming scheme at £3.5 and then the forestry. And that totals 19.3. Yeah. Uh, then we've got the Farm Business Improvement Scheme at 4.6, waste recycling at 3.2, and the Tripsy programme at 3.2. That's the lion's share of those. Okay. So the largest there, obviously, is the Rural, rural Development Leader programme. Yes. Um, then, if you go on down, you have a state transformation, what, uh, which is 2.4 million. What does this what cover? What's this mean? Uh, that's uh, a much smaller amount. Um, 1.6 of it is in uh, the estate transformation division within the department, and that's uh, a number of small projects uh, across the specialised estate, with a further 0.9 million in AFB itself. So it's it's not part of any um, big significant project, but it's, it's it's more more smaller scale ones. Yeah. Okay. And the last last question I just want to uh, ask you it's it's in relation again to your state. You mentioned you mentioned uh, a few moments ago about you hope to have four hundred staff in DERA headquarters now in Ballykelly. If you have four hundred staff up in Ballykelly, how many is that leaving? Now he's working in Dundonald House then? Um, so the, I suppose there's a, a bit of a, a shifting sand in this. Whenever the decision was taken by the executive to establish Ballykelly, we didn't have Brexit. Um, and this was a relocation programme of around about 650, nearly 700 staff who would relocate. Uh, but since the, the advent of the EU exit, the number of Brexit staff are in addition to the, um, the staff that we would have had as head, what would have been headquarters relocation. My understanding is that the number probably is still up around the 500, 600 mark, um, and the 400 that we will have uh, in Ballykelly. And maybe just to qualify when I say we will have, we, we have around about 320, 330 there currently. Then we also have a number of vacancies which are earmarked to be filled in Ballykelly, and that will take us to the 400. The target that we actually had was to have 320 staff. Uh, in Ballykelly by March 2021, so we obviously have exceeded that at this stage. Um, so a, a wee bit of a shift in sand um, in terms of there are still some posts that have to transfer, but we've added now posts from the Brexit point of view, mm -hmm. which I say is the, the 253, although not all of those are in uh, Dundonald House. They are spread across our estate, whether it be in the Klondike building, some in Ballykelly, but probably the majority of them are, are sitting in Dundonald House. So a very long-winded way of saying there's probably still around about 500 each staff in Dundonald House. Right. Okay. And uh, while it's not, you don't mention it in, do you, in your papers here, can you give me any idea of the final cost of the building and the outfitting of your new DERA headquarters? So my understanding, the total cost was around about £17 million, pounds, um, which included the land, the clearance of the land, and then the actual build. That's the total cost. Right. And that includes outfit and everything. Yeah, that's everything. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we have got Claire. Thank you, Chair. Um, am I right? Is that 17.6 in reduced requirements? Was that money sent back? But am I reading that right? Uh, in January monitor. Yeah, sorry, in the January. Yes, that was, that was, that was right? sent back uh, to, to DOF in that round, and then it, the executive agreed to reallocate it to other departments. Okay. Um, and it's great to see that the commitments um, from the New Deal and your approach are being bid for as well with the Climate Act, uh, Climate Change Act and the Environment Protection Agency in particular, um, all of them. But So you've put in a bid for the scope and study to see financial implications or costs for setting up the, inter the Independent Environment Protection Agency. If that bid is refused, will we still go ahead with that? 
Um, well, I suppose the, the bid's in, and mm. the Minister, I think, has already indicated his intention to work through the detail of what an Environment Protection Agency would be like, and it is a commitment under the, the yeah. new decade, new approach, so I, I would expect that he would ask us as officials to follow it through. Right. And if you any estimated timeline for how long that should take for this Copen study? Um, well, given the money that we've bid for is in the 2021, the it should be done within the year. Okay. And can I just ask one more then? Go back to the, the projected cost on remediation for um, my boy. Um, can I ask, are we still getting fines for my boy and for the environmental damage? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Are we getting any fines? <coughs> Have we ever been fined by the EU for the oh, damage caused? For infraction or yeah. something like that? Uh, I'm not aware of any infraction fines. No. no. We've we, never we, could, we could maybe come back and clarify. Uh, we're not aware, but we're more than happy to come back and, and have that clarified for you. And have we, do we get yeah. regular fines for any climate or environmental infractions? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any recent uh, infraction fines. Although there was some in, in DOE before the departments came together, but certainly in the last three years, I'm not aware of any infraction fines. Okay, thank you. Thanks. All right. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'd just simply like to say um, I'd welcome the Rural Development Programme and we set aside for that on the Farm Business Improvement Scheme. It's good to see. Thank you. Right. Go on. Chair, just back to Bally Kelly, more for information than I think. Uh, I'm not sure if I got the figures right. <coughs> Decentralisation, of course, was warmly welcomed by, by people at the time. And I'm really pleased that uh, it, certainly from what I can find out is working. Uh, but it is a bit disappointing that there's still 500, is it, in Dundonald House? It seems to me that the decentralisation programme hasn't quite gone as well as it might have. That's one element. The other one is, are there other government departments now in Ballykelly House as well as Department of Agriculture? Um, so, so with regard to the number who are in Dundonald House, a number of those staff are Brexit posts that were never in the original overall headcount that there would have been for Dundonald House. Um, but we've actually moved 400 posts out yes. of Dundonald House. Yeah. Um, it's really the Brexit posts that have been added on since the decision was taken, which is why it remains that high number. Um, so I, I would sort of suggest the decentralisation from the department's point of view has, has worked. And one, we have exceeded the target um, considerably yeah. beforehand. Plus, we anticipate that the building will meet, re reach its maximum capacity in the very near future, most definitely within the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, so from that point of view, I would suggest it, it has been a, a success for the, for the department. And as somebody who works in the building, um, at a, and I know that Rosemary has visited the building. Yep. It's, a, certainly it's a great building. I would yeah. in, in terms, it, sorry, go ahead. In, in terms of uh, other departmental decentralisation, or sorry, in terms of any other department in the building, um, whenever this was approved, it was a headquarters relocation for DERA, or as it was DART, going back to, to when the project started. Um, and we've remained committed to that um, ministerial. Uh, wasn't a direction, but the, what the minister wanted at that time. Um, I, I think it would be fair to say we have been approached by some other departments who have, a, who have asked us uh, could they take space. Mm -hmm. However, we believe we can maximise the space ourselves as a department. Um, uh, there is a review ongoing with the Strategic Investment Board looking at the success of Ballykelly. Mm -hmm. um, and I know when Fiona is here as part of the estate's transformation, um, she, she can comment more authoritatively on, on where that is uh, than I can. Um, but... but you know, it, it is a DERA building. Um, it's not an NICS hub building, but I, you know, in the future, it may be something else. Yeah, the chairperson, I, I wish you every success with it. Uh, I think the way the world is watching, and I hope other government departments are taking uh, recognition of what has been achieved, and that the decentralisation program uh, won't simply be one government department, but but with impact it will be all because we talked about climate change and all sorts of things. It took me some time to get here today to, uh, to Belfast. And I'm not suggesting storm would be decentralised, but certainly there was a lot of people in cars going to government departments uh, could easily be operating from other areas. Absolutely. OK, thank you. Um, Brian, just uh, um, before you leave, thank you, John. Um, the the NAFIS, NAFIS, not in the... Um, 
briefing paper that the milestones haven't been met, that there's high level defects, lengthy delays, and this could have a huge impact on the agri food sector here in terms of traceability. Now, obviously, you know, we're looking towards international markets for our produce. This is a very high producing region for, for very uh, nutritious, traceable, high quality um, produce. What, what, what is the delays and the issues with the introduction of NAFIS? Um, you've, you've probably alluded to quite a few of them, Chair. Um, this was a, a project where a contract was awarded in April 2016, um, and we had anticipated that it would have been completed towards the latter stage of 2018. Um, unfortunately, the quality of the software that we've received to date from the uh, contractor, a company called AMT Cybex, which is part of the Capita Group, um, wasn't up to the quality standard, uh, and there's been quite a... An, a bit of going backwards and forwards with AMT Cybex on this. Um, we are currently considering what's called a rectification plan from uh, the company with a view to getting a firm date on when we will see some of the various stages completed. Um, it is very disappointing, I have to say. Um, I think the papers maybe suggest that I appointed as the SRO in January, uh, early part of January this year, so I'm currently reviewing all aspects of this particular contract. Um, hopefully you'll also... Uh, understand there are a lot of commercial sensitivities around this at the moment and I really wouldn't like to go too far into it because of the fact we're looking at the rectification plan but it is very unfortunate that we, we don't have the new system in place. But maybe to give the, co the, the committee some comfort, um, the AFIS, which is the system that we currently use, remains fit for purpose. <clears throat> and The reason that we were seeking to replace it was it had some uh, flexibilities that we would have liked to have had going forward in terms of how it interacts with other systems within the department, within AFB, that AFIS cannot do. So it's quite a clunky system. Um, and it also has some limitations in terms of the what we call the strategic alignment within the department around how we manage IT as a whole. So there's no doubt that AFIS needs to be replaced, but to give assurance both to the committee and to those who interact and use AFIS, it remains fit for purpose. It does what it says it does on the tin in terms of traceability. So it, it is something that is very much at the forefront of my mind. What do we do going forward um, with this particular contract? I suppose, just, just following on to that there, you know, how much has been spent to date, Brian, in terms of implementing NAFIS, and how confident are you that the issues can be addressed and we can get your system implemented? So since April 2019, to date, um, with, in terms of development costs, the department's incurred expenditure of around 10.9 million on the project. Um, uh, how confident I am, again, I, I, I would like to defer that question solely because uh, there are some commercial sensitivities uh, and, and that we are looking at the rectification plan, and that will result in a decision from the department. Um, so I would prefer if you wouldn't mind, maybe not saying too much more at this stage. Okay, well, thank you for that, Brian. But uh, can I also make a suggestion if the committee agrees that uh, given the huge importance of our traceability and the appropriate and effective system to achieve that there, that we can get a follow up uh, briefing from yourselves in relation to NIFIS, because it's something we want to keep a focus on. Uh, more than happy to do that. Yeah, okay, that. Happy to do that. Yeah. okay. So um, I'd like to uh, thank you, thank you very much, and indeed thank the members for asking questions. Um, okay. okay, can I get the agreement from the committee now that we go into closed session for a, a very uh, brief moment to consider some correspondence that we just received? Agreed. Good. Okay, uh, we're going to now receive an oral briefing on the UK Agriculture Bill from Brexit and the Environment Group. And I want to refer you to the briefing paper from the Brexit Environment Group on pages 10 to 24 of your table of papers. And also in the table of papers at 25 to 26 is a list of the clauses in the bill where legislative consent is required. 
The members will be, wish, will be aware that this is the first of a number of briefings scheduled on the uh, Agriculture Bill. I want to advise members that the following papers have been included in the pack. Uh, the UK Agriculture Bill, pages 90 to 183, UK Agriculture Bill Memorandum, 184-297, Explanatory Notes 289-365 and House of Commons Research Paper 366-443. I'd like to extend a welcome here now to uh, Vivian uh, Gra um, Gravy and uh, Mary Dobbs, and I'd like to invite you to uh, brief the committee. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, so we're both here representing both Brexit and the environment, which is a network of academics across the UK working on how Brexit is impacting the environment, uh, but also Queen's, where uh, I'm in politics at Queen's and Mary is in law at Queen's. Um, so we've had the chance of giving evidence to quite a lot of parliaments across the UK on these issues, and we're very happy to finally be able to do it here. Um, so what we did in the briefing paper is there's a quite a lot of covering what has been talked about on agricultural policy after Brexit across the UK for the last three years, and then focusing strictly on the Agricultural Bill as well, looking at questions more generally around the debates right now in GB on what's wrong with the bill, um, and what's good as well, and uh, specific issues for Northern Ireland. So we're very happy to talk through these different elements. Um, I don't know how you want to proceed. Is it, is it like going straight to questions, or do you want us to like start setting out uh, general points? Okay. General points? Okay. Um, so in terms of I guess for us, the first starting point would be that we can't talk about future agricultural policy without looking at current agricultural policy, and that we need to look at what's good, what's bad with it, um, and realise that there is, as members of this committee will well know, there is a lot of diversity in how the common agricultural policy has been implemented in the UK. Um, and that means we are not starting from a common policy, actually, despite its name. We have big, big differences between how England, Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland have looked at it. Um, and this means, this also explains why we're seeing such a shift in England towards, uh, you know, environmental public goods and paying um, public money for public goods, because the way the cap was implemented in England uh, was that most of the money from the second pillar, so from rural development, was already going to agri-environmental agri schemes, which is not the case in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, we're seeing lots of other differences, such as minimum claim size, whether there's couple support or not. Um, and this is something that I think lots of people in the UK debate are not necessarily always aware, that there's actually quite a lot of differences in the cap currently. Um, now, a lot of the debates around the cap and the future of the cap was, uh, here in the UK has to do with the environmental aspects of it. And that's because we have two general types of instruments. Uh, in the cap that matter a lot for this discussion, two that actually were started in the UK and then picked up at EU level, cross-compliance and agri-environmental schemes. Mm -hmm. Now, cross-compliance is the idea that in order to get any kind of agricultural funding, farmers have to actually comply with environmental rules, but also rules on you know, animal welfare and kind of good environmental practices. And this is looking uh, as Mary would confirm, at the UK bill that it, this is likely going out. We're going to get rid of cross-compliance. Um, and that raises huge issues around what's going to be a regulatory floor. Because you can't stop, you can't really start paying farmers for doing additional environmental goods, like providing additional environmental goods, if you're not really clear about where is the regulatory floor or regulatory baseline. If they're, if they're doing less, then they should be fined. Polluters, you know, polluters should be paying for this. If they're doing more, then perhaps they should be, you know, actually giving, uh, given money for it. You know, it's this whole idea of provider gets. And where we draw that regulatory floor, whether it's the same between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, whether it's the same between NI and GB, is really at the, ha the heart of the debates we're having right now on the Agricultural Bill, but also on the Environmental Bill that are both going through Westminster at the moment. Um, so I think that's, that would be my key point, I guess, for me. Uh, but more generally, in terms of the agricultural bill, what we're seeing is that for over the last, we're talking about in Westminster of a first environmental bill, a first agricultural bill in a generation. This is very odd in that I'm French and we, while being EU members, we kept on doing agricultural bills, we kept on doing environmental bills. What we're seeing is that the way that the UK has, has engaged with the EU, that a lot of these issues were 
not really touched upon by Westminster. We've seen both Europeanization happening, but also devolution, which means that actually the devolved administrations and devolved assemblies were perhaps much more engaging with these issues than Westminster. And with Brexit and this discussions around taking back control, we have have to deal with at the same time the question of who is actually ending up taking back that control, whether it's devolved or central, and what you are actually going to be doing with the control. And that's what makes this agricultural bill so different to others, is that we're both talking about who has the power and the content of the policy. That will be all for me. I will keep mine relatively brief, as I realise everybody is under time pressure as well. Um, just for the relationship between Northern Ireland and the UK agricultural bill, a large focus for you is looking at whether how to engage with it and whether to approve or to support, suggest changes or to try and challenge. Part of that question has to be about whether you want it to extend to Northern Ireland or not. And I think one of the benefits that can be uh, striven for right now is to use it as a breathing space to go and consider that it is not actually necessary to uh, seek to have it applied to Northern Ireland as well, that there are certain elements of it obviously within the Schedule 6 that will apply and there are certain UK uh, components that will apply across, but that actually what it can do is give you a little bit of a breathing space to, because there's a lot to be dealt with at the moment beyond agriculture, but also in dealing with the protocol, going and looking at how that will shift, looking at how the general context will shift, and to say, well, actually, the, the UK Agriculture Bill provides for the continuation, along with promises from the government, provides for the continuation of funding for the moment. It allows for the adaptation of the basic payment scheme, but it allows for that to continue on for Northern Ireland for the moment. It allows for the continuation on of the rural development funding for Northern Ireland. And it's differential treatment for the devolved administrations. And so looking at the UK Agricultural Bill, it's important to think, I mean, we, we as academics will also go, what's the broader impact on the UK? And we should all be looking at the broader in impact on the UK. But there's also that more isolated one of going, how will this impact directly on Northern Ireland? And actually for Northern Ireland, it is nearly a breathing space. Then there are questions about, um, does it go and over-centralise? And there are issues about agreement on agriculture, the classifications and so forth. Um, but also, if it is a breathing space, what do you want to do for the future? Because the civil servants have been undertaking great work along with the stakeholders over the last few years. They've got the draft agricultural strategy, which is a good starting point. Um, and building from the bottom up is something that would hopefully get greater buy-in. Um, but also, there's elements to be learned from, from the agriculture bill. Because as we outlined within the briefing paper, there are a lot of issues substantively with the content, with how it's going, being developed, the implementation and so forth. But they're also really nice positives, like they deal with agricultural tenancies. And one of the oddities in Northern Ireland is Conacre. And yet, that's where actually maybe we can adjust it and we can provide for long-term approaches. Um, and so within the bill, you have the briefing paper. I don't know whether you had the opportunity to read it since it was last minute and it's quite extensive, sorry. Um, but the agriculture bill provides for the amendment of agricultural tenancies within England. And it allows for them to be amended uh, with rules uh, with the role of arbitrators um, where it is to facilitate the objectives of the bill and public money for public goods and considering conacre 11 months tenancies effectively i realize they're not quite tenancies but effectively 11 month use of a land it's very difficult to do long-term goals um, and so maybe that's something we can look to the uk agriculture bill and go okay they've got public money for public goods this seems quite nice They've got amendments for agricultural tenancies. This seems quite nice and useful. They've got um, suggestions for the general information. Now, that, that gets very complicated. But there are definite learning points within the agriculture bill. So if we take it as a breathing space and something that we can learn from is that aspect. And then there's the legislative consent about whether you actually want to go and say, we approve this or not. And I'm going to stop then. Um. Thank you for that uh, briefing. Hi, I'm Julian. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, very informative. Um, I suppose, uh, well, we'll I move to the members. John Blair. Thank, thank you, Chair, and can I thank Vivian and Mary both as well for that and for, for the papers as uh, submitted. Yes. Um, well, one question that I'll tease out the expression you use as a starting point of intra UK divergence. Um, is there a lesson in that for, for us and, and for other members of the Assembly and, and the Department that um, 
one of the things we might wish to do in what you refer to as a breathing space is examine how Northern Ireland can keep up with change and divergence in other regions. And I say keep up in terms of competing where necessary, but also uh, in relation to collaborating where necessary. Is that, is that a fair reflection on what needs to be done or part of what needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I think in a way, the fact that we already have divergence should reassure us that you know, there can be some divergence. It's okay to have you know, different policies yeah. to a certain extent. But of course, there's a question of the impact on the UK single market. And here, I mean, we're seeing that there's going to be a lot of work that needs doing on exactly how the UK single market is going to work. Um, now, in terms of keeping up, Northern Ireland being the smallest of the administration, Northern Irish farms being the smaller, smallest of the farms, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Northern Ireland. And I think that there, I mean, in terms of breathing space, I agree with Mary, but I think it's also about being able to pick your battles. And there's not going to be, perhaps it's not completely adopt the English approach. Look at what, having a bit of time gives you time to look at what Scotland and Wales are doing as well. And being able to, you know, adapt these different models and not just develop everything here because there's just not going to be have enough resources. Now, in terms of divergence, um, of course, we have to talk about the protocol as well. There are some ways in which Northern Ireland is not going to be able to diverge as much from the status quo because it will be bound by some EU rules that the others may not. It really all depends on whatever the future relationship is. Now, in here, I don't know how much like, we're looking again at the protocol. Most of it is around food, like the rules that the um, Northern Ireland has to comply with, food, animal welfare. There's actually very little on the environmental side, um, which is quite worrying from a kind of you know, divergence downward on the environment front. So Northern Ireland is both constrained by the lack of resources, but also limited in terms of how much it can diverge because of the protocol. Um, so <laughs> it's very challenging ahead, I'd say. I'd mainly echo what Viviana is saying there. It's, it, firstly, it's not that scary as regards, in general, the idea of having flexibility, but it depends how much divergence goes ahead. Um, so we have divergence currently. We can acknowledge that that's possible. It depends on the type of divergence, and it depends on the extent of the divergence. So currently, we would have the same objectives. We would have the same general procedures and then we can either up the level or we can have variations, but we have shared core at the same time. Um, there is the potential for that to shift quite dramatically in the future. That could give us a competitive edge or it could give us basically the, the raw edge as well, or the raw side of the deal. Um, and that is very much about we need to keep communicating. We need to see whether there are some areas where we need to have shared approaches. The, the lovely phrase of common frameworks um, whether that be to do with environment, whether it be to do with food standards, um, whether it be to do with the, the funding limit, the funding approaches. Um, there are variations seen. Scotland's taking its own approach so far in relation to it. Wales is, has gone for the breather approach. It was pushing it and it said, we need a little bit more space. Um, there, there isn't a clear cut edge. There's that bit, I'm oh, sorry, clear cut answer. There is, we, we always want that competitive edge for ourselves. But if we are seeking that competitive edge and we're going, we'll take divergence to get that competitive edge, we risk everybody else diverging to get the competitive edge as well. And then that could be more burdensome and more challenging for us. Either they go for the high quality and they bump it up much higher, or they start going, well, we don't care about standards. We'll push it down further and further. So the rest of the UK is free to go and to do whatever it likes, essentially, within international constraints and within its own land constraints. Northern Ireland, we have specific elements within the protocol that we have to comply with. What would be preferable for Northern Ireland, both to keep the competition relatively equal and also to ensure our market access is truly unfettered, is for the rest of the UK to go and comply with that as well, those specific baselines. And then from the environmental food perspective, obviously we'd like decent standards. So there's the, the competitive element and then there's the general standard element of we like quality of food, we like quality yeah. of environment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, further to that, Chair, and, and with your permission, uh, is the lesson therein then that if the quality of our food is our USP, that a collaborative approach 
in terms of working outside what we see as the department that we're here to discuss. Outside of that, we should also be thinking of the work we do with the Department for Economy, with local councils within the community planning model, which is still evolving, given the importance of agriculture to our rural economies. Um, that we need to have a joined up approach then in selling and marketing and, and working yeah. uh, for that USP as I describe it. Yeah. Absolutely. I think yeah. collaboration is one of the most beneficial approaches that you can take, whether that be to general food policy or more broadly. Um, so, yes. Yep. So. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, John. Um, well, on your uh, paper, um, Marian, Fabian, you made a very stark um, prediction that without direct financial support, approximately 30% of lands or la farms are likely to cease functioning, leading to unemployment, land abandonment, knock on effects with the agri food sector and rural communities in, in, in particular. Um, now, uh, what I was going to ask is, is, is that relating to, the, you know, you're talking about direct financial support, you're talking about the, the current schemes that we have at present, like the single farm payment, for example? Correct. So your assessment is that without the single farm payment, that thirty percent of farms would uh, are likely to cease functioning to land. But presumably that would also lead to very serious environmental implications as well. If yes, land. So I mean, rewilding is one thing, but land abandonment is also bad for the environment, or can have potentially negative consequences for the environment. Um, the thirty percent evaluation uh, is initially based in a, a colleague of ours assessment, Dr. Ludivine Petitin in Cardiff, um, and supported by um, colleagues who work in uh, economics as well, who have gone evaluated. It's partially linked to the heavy reliance on direct payments that currently exist. So um, basically nearly 90% of income for farmers, the total mm -hmm. farm income, comes from payments um, and from funding supports coming into the farmers. Um, a lot of our farmers four-fifths of them are operating in less favoured areas, they're operating cat cattle and sheep farming. It's very difficult to make uh, a living out yeah. of this type of farming. It's also very difficult to shift the type of farming that you're undertaking. Um, and hence, they're very vulnerable. Um, and if we add in the broader contextual shifts at the moment as well, with uncertainties in the market, uncertainties of access to, actually access to the market, mm -hmm. um, um, we don't know what the future relationship is going to look like yet, but even the, under the protocol, there are still changes that are going to come about. Um, it just makes it very difficult for farmers to undertake their activities and think and to know for definite they're going to be able to financially survive. And that has important consequences for our society, it has important consequences for our economy and for the individuals themselves, and yes, very much for the environment. And just, to, just to add to that, I think Ludivine's numbers were about DEFRA and it was about England uh, at first. Uh, and I think there's, we're seeing that if you compare the debates happening, the whole idea of having of keeping farmers on the land and minimising structural change is something you see in the debates in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. It's not something you're seeing in the debates in England. It is not one of the objectives of the Agriculture Bill. Having farmers move out of agriculture is not considered a problem in England. Uh, and, but it could be considered a problem here, um, as it is in Wales and, and, North, and Scotland. So I think it, it's really about whether, what, what type of objective you want your future agricultural policy to have, and whether it is about you know, maintaining farmers on the land or maintaining jobs in rural areas that are linked to, uh, to farming or not. And we're really seeing a lot of differences here in, inside the UK currently. And see, so may just to pick up on your point uh, there, you mentioned about the difficulties for farmers. Would have you any assessment of the impact of the removal of the ANC from farmers here in the north? The impact it has has had on them, given the fact in the south that it's very well funded. Uh, I, w I do not have the, the knowledge to be able to answer that effectively as regards to the impact for them. I, I, I'm aware that you're going to have individuals coming in from various organisations, so I think I'll happily yeah. leave that to them rather than claiming any expertise. I'll pass it around here, John Dallas. Chairperson, thanks very much for this document. I find it extremely useful. In your introduction, you said it created a breathing space. A breathing space in itself creates uncertainty for the future. And uh, certainly I don't believe any of us would want to repeat the history of the past, the flight from the land, the erosion of the rural community, the speeding up of the closure of rural schools, 
uh, the demise of small villages and small towns. And it's all written here because we all know that Britain has got a population of 70 million people. They're going to source uh, food from the cheapest uh, place they can find it. And my question to you is, how can we protect those people who are living in the rural areas, particularly in the hills, who are a critical part of our makeup of our population? Because if they are reading this document as I read it, uh, there's desperate uncertainty there. And rural people, small farmers, are not not they don't they're not crying out for charity they're crying out for recognition for their contribution to where they live is the setting up of co-ops is there any ideas on how they can uh, i think minimize what's coming down the line because being realistic there there is a, a honeymoon period built into this to buy people over but after that we are not England, and I'm not being political. We are a completely different uh, set up in every way possible. What can you advise us? So I think, I think I'm going to speak for Vivian for a second ago. I think we would agree entirely with what you are saying about the differences in the society and difference in the land makeup and so forth. Um, when I say a breathing space, firstly, I don't mean that we should sit back on our laurels and do nothing. Um, it is a breathing space. Uh, to, to take stock and go, what do we want our future society and our future land use to look like? And then it is setting into play urgently meetings, getting that collaboration that you refer to going, building what the civil servants have been doing and the stakeholder group, and looking to that culture bill and seeing what bits you like or what bits you don't like. Because there's some good stuff in there, but there are also ones that work for maybe England, but not for Northern Ireland, and also bits that just are complex and don't work at all. Um, so I think setting objectives, setting out what you see the future of agricultural policy looking like at a relatively early stage is very important to help resolve the uncertainties. I think looking at broader than just the agricultural element, but thinking this is, don't silo it, and look at the infrastructure, look at saying we are going to invest we, we value our people, we are going to invest in you in the rural communities. We'll make it capable for you to stay out there in where you live currently, where you have these communities, rather than trying to get everyone into Belfast. Um, it's, it's not good for the people or for the land to have everyone congregated and to have that land abandonment. So I think acknowledging the differences and the values that are there. You don't have to highlight the differences, it's just about the values that you have within Northern Ireland and saying these are our overarching objectives that we'll have at the end and say we will implement resources. The positive uh, for the moment is that the government has said that they will provide funding until 2024. Um, so that is there at least that we know the funding is coming into Northern Ireland, that we will have access to it. So I know it's only for four years, but at least you can guarantee that that will be available for that duration. Other things to push for, um, in the report we refer to Lord Bew's review of the financing and the difficulty in the long term is that financing is part of the Barnet formula, it's part of the block grant, CAP, Ring Fence just had it there and we could all access it for specific things and you didn't have to justify to the people that it was going to specific things. Um, there's a production for a potential for the funding to be reduced in the future, um, specifically since it's proportionate to England's approach but also it has to be justified more. Lord Bew's review did not go very far in looking at future elements. It dealt with certain issues, but it didn't go very far. One thing to consider would be trying to push for Westminster to agree to a, a broader review based on needs rather than the spending in England. And that then links into your objectives. And so if you can say, well, we've got good objectives here, like we have valuable things we're trying to achieve, in order to do that, we need X amount of funding. And then to have that as something where you can go, well, actually, we'll have a base floor of it will meet our needs for the future. That's a very political thing. It's not something we can <laughs> contribute to, unfortunately, but that is one thing that could be done. But also, I mean, there is some certainty provided by the protocol because the UK Ag Bill doesn't provide a lot of certainty. It says about information that may be required by the Secretary of State. They may provide all these different requirements. The protocol requires compliance still 
with specific elements of EU law in relation to the production of food, in relation to the quality of food. That still must all be complied with. So yes, it can be referred to as bureaucratic red tape, but there's still certainty there. And we've spoken with a lot of farmers at a lot of different events, and one of their big concerns is not really the uncertainty regarding funding, but uncertainty regarding what they will have to comply with in the future. Um, and weirdly, everyone was like, red tape, red tape, red tape. They actually were sort of saying for a lot of them, at least we know what's required. At least we know that this is what we have to retain, the information and what we'll have to provide. So the protocol is still retain some of that. That's great. Thanks. So just before we go on next speaker, it's just connected to what John had said there a moment ago um, about the prospect of Britain entering into a trade deal with other countries where they would be important, perhaps food that would be inferior. In some ways, is our adherence to the uh, EU regulations around agri-food a firewall that will, that will prevent our farmers here from being inundated with cheap and fair imports from the rest of the world? I would think so, but well, you're not you're shaking your head, but I was also going your point about George Eustace earlier as well today. Yeah, so I think I mean, we, we're all interested to see who's uh, going to replace Theresa Villiers there. And if it is indeed George Eustace, he's been very strong on uh, animal welfare standards yeah. for future trade. Um, I think in general there's, there's concern that you know, UK farmers should not be held to higher standard, like to high standard. Like it's very good that we hold our farmers to high standards, but we should make sure they're not undercut by imports. Um, and that's one of the key fight right now in Westminster on the bill. And I think that is something that really matters a lot, especially as well from, from a devolved perspective, because there's a lot of questions around agriculture is devolved, but trade is not. And it's all it's very you can't really have a very ambitious env environmental and agricultural policy if the trade aspect is not taken into account. So I think it raises a bigger question of how you can have devolved voices heard in the trade negotiations preparation uh, more, more broadly. Uh, but to go back to the point on this is like, again, this whole idea of regulatory floor, I think we need both a UK wide regulatory floor in terms of animal welfare, these kind of things, so that there is no undercutting uh, within the UK, but that that same floor is then applied as well to our imports. If I, sorry, just. I think the protocol helps protect the food yeah. within Northern Ireland, yeah. so it'll pr provide the protection here. It doesn't help with the competition when you're trying to sell into GB. That's yeah. the difficulty. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's for the consumer, great. For the farmer, for the uh, those involved in production, mm. less positive. But presumably, with Britain being 60, only 61 percent cent self-sufficient, that if they enter into trade deals with the rest of the world, that the British market won't be the same anyway. Because if they enter into trade deals, the rest of the British market won't be as vibrant as we th as currently is, perhaps. That's a very political thing, though. Because, <laughs> and, but it, if, imagine you are there signing off on trade deals that say we're lowering the standards. And if there's a lower, an obvious reduction in standards, people will go, you promised us. It was in your manifesto and you've repeatedly said, and don't we deserve high quality food? Yeah. Um, so it's an extremely political thing to reduce it. So it's, there's going to be a tension there between we need to be fed and we need to do it cheaply. We also want to protect our own producers and make sure that they're not undercut as well. And we also have <coughs> consumers. Who, so we, we don't know how this will work. Out. Okay. I think we can see she's a lawyer, though. It's like <laughs> a whole politician. Very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> I move on very swiftly because I'm conscious of everybody's time. Uh, Claire is next, and then Philip after that. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. And I've looked at some of your other work as well. And mm -hmm. again, you just make very complex issues set out in very understandable ways. Um, and maybe we want to go back to the issue of looking at what the proposal coming forward at the minute is and how that sort of is a, a, what you're called cross compliant mm -hmm. um, with others. So we have legal agreements, we have you know, well, legal plus agreed in terms of the protocol, um, environmental standards, the climate um, crisis uh, and biodiversity, and also the work that the department has done with the stakeholders in coming up with draft um, plans. Mm -hmm. uh, how does it all marry up with what's on the table at the minute, <laughs> in your assessment? <laughs> It doesn't. Yeah, I would thanks. say. I think, okay. I mean, no, but I think it is. It is impossible. Like it, it couldn't. I mean, everything is moving at the same time. So it is. You know, it's always difficult to have coherent policy across department. But when everyone is revising everything at the same time, and we don't know who ends up deciding what, yeah. it's impossible. So, which is why I think, whether it's a breathing space, whether it's just a sunset close or an invitation to rethink, 
most of these policies that are going to have to be in place in order, like after the transition, that we need them. I think we need to really put in that, that we know we're not going to get everything right the first time around, and we need to force ourselves to look back at them and to make sure that perhaps they're not super coherent at first, but that we revise them that to, to move toward that. I think that's the most realistic approach. Um, now, of course, now, so there are some tensions there that we need to, like the bigger ones we can perhaps address, but it won't all fit together. <laughs> so, the weird thing is that if the agricultural bill had come into being whilst member of the EU, we'd be going public money for public goods, great idea, we can do this with CAP, and it would complement the existing regime currently. But because of that shifting frameworks all underneath, the foundations are being shifted, with losing the regulatory floor baseline of all the environmental standards, some of the food, things like that. That's part of the challenge there as well. It's not working in the same context, and it has to acknowledge that. We have to acknowledge that for Northern Ireland. Not for Although just, just to add something, because we've got our... So the environmental strategy has just received quite a lot of feedback, and I think... And the pressure on, like, with COP26, you know, there's going to be more and more pressure to justify everything on the basis of what, how are we addressing the climate breakdown, the biodiversity crisis with these policies. And that is a language that works quite well as well in the UK. So in terms of convincing the Treasury to give funding <coughs> for Northern Ireland, it will also be important for Northern Ireland to be able to speak in that language. So I think it is clearly in the interest of farmers in Northern Ireland and the agri-food industry more generally to be able to say, to be able to justify <coughs> requests for funding because it will deliver on the environment. And that's the, the shift we're seeing in England. And because it's going to be the shift in England, that's going to be the language the Treasury understands the most. Um, Littler? Yeah, thank you. Philip? Uh, given that you said quite a bit, uh, agriculture <coughs> and trade isn't, and the, you know, the protocol is kind of protecting the all island economy. I mean, will there be more harmonisation in this aspect, north and south? And, and what, what are the implications you see for trade north and south? I'm not sorry. I think, um, in terms of food, uh, in terms of animal welfare, in terms of all well, that, which, I mean, lots of the inter like agri food. Supply chains, like the milk crossing the border five times, all of that, that, that really matters a lot for these kind of goods. So I think that's good in terms of being able to keep these supply chain going. But what we're seeing is that a lot of current cooperation on the island of Ireland, also in the environment, we're seeing like joint implementation of the Water Framework Directive, for example. The Water Framework Directive is not in the protocol. Um, there's questions around nitrates and around you know, slurry moving north-south. Nitrates directive is not in the protocol, so there are some gaps there. Okay, so even you know, even if there's some, you know, protecting that truck going from north to south, yes, but you can still have quite a lot of divergence between the rules that farmers will have to meet in the north and in the south. <coughs> okay. Would expect some divergence, but also it also depends on how things work between Northern Ireland and GB because the market may shift, as in Northern Ireland's export market may shift depending on what happens in GB. Um, so if that's impacted, then in some ways it may have knock-on and potentially increase the role of uh, Ireland or the rest of the EU as an export market. Yeah. But generally, greater divergence, except we're protected by the protocol, and then it depends on what happens with the market for access to the market for the GB. And in any case, any kind of, we're going to have more paperwork. That that is the the end, the end point anyway is going to have, even if, because you're going to have to be able to say we've complied with everything, whether coming from GB into here or you know going the other way around. There's going to be perhaps less actually pressure on Northern Ireland goods, but lots of Northern Ireland goods. You know these all island supply chains end up in GB a lot of the case. You know so we're talking about mo goods moving from Northern Ireland to be transformed, and change in like milk going to cheese in Ireland and then going over to GB. So it's going to be the more divergence between these three parts it, anyway is going to end up costing more uh, for farmers in Northern Ireland. And we are talking about groups that have very limited amount of money to play around with. So business going out of business, most likely. Okay. Philip. Okay, and last thing here is Harry. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You know? I understood it was in, but... Oh, sorry, sorry. My fault, my fault. Just to be quick, what's the same as your 
One commentary that I had noted, and that's just like this land less amenable here, and small farms, one to two farmers um, without. <coughs> and also support 30% of them not able to keep going. Unless, of course, you know, they change how they do things and what they do. I mean, if we look them, they can help them be diversify a wee bit, you know. Um, yeah, having, so diversifying, it's all great, but if you are in a very small farm and it's just you uh, and perhaps sometimes the kids coming back the weekend helping out a bit, it's very hard to completely radically shift. So that's why, I mean, the smaller the farm, the less breathing space going back you have in terms of just like starting to shift policy. So that's where I think there's a shift across the four nations to more advice and actually support and potentially doing things that's kind of landscape scale for uh, environmental perspe perspective. But if we can make, you know, help farmers work together with their neighbors to like deliver a common environmental agenda and being paid all, all together, then that would potentially help. But it, it takes a lot of, it is a mental shift, right, between you know, you're the or you're the you're a farmer on your land. This is your land, and you do whatever you want on it. To you actually have to work with your neighbours. Um, so it's going to take a long, long time, and that's why we really need that transition period uh, for agriculture. Like they're talking about, perhaps seven years in England to move from the current system to the future one. But in Northern Ireland, considering the average age as well of farmers, um, all that you know, it's going to be extremely difficult. You don't want to lose the farmers and the transfers and that's it. You don't, no. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chair. And William. Yeah, so thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. It's just a comment, I think. I think it's good. Well, no, for number one, it's good that we're guaranteed payments to, to 2024. I think governments can't really go much further than that, you know, at uh, one step at a time. But I think it's important that we... Northern Ireland try our best to maintain the same, and I, I might need to clear an industry because I'm partner in a business that does claim basic property payment. Um, but I think we in Northern Ireland should have and will have the ability and the flexibility to deliver that in the way we feel fit, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So what it means is if we want to target and help people in the hills or do other things, we have the ability to do that, isn't that right? Well, I, I, think, I think Northern Ireland should have the flexibility in the future, yeah. I think we do, uh, to my knowledge, isn't that right? So the bill doesn't the, the, the bill doesn't outline approaches yeah. for Northern Ireland, but again, it doesn't do that any longer for Wales either, because Wales said, "Forget about us for the moment. We'll we'll deal with this in a, another year's time. We're trying to build our own thing." Yeah. Um, but it's devolved, so Northern yeah. Ireland has the devolved powers. There are limitations because there are limitations on the agreement on agriculture, but that doesn't prevent environmental payments, that doesn't prevent decoupled payments that aren't about produce more, we give you more. Um, there are limits on that, but that's not getting well, us decoupled. Well, do you see uh, um, wheels, I think, of decoupled payments that are yeah. Yeah. Um, So that's the, the general approach is decoupled payments at this stage. There's a lot of flexibility. It does depend a bit on what the UK does in the future as regards trade agreements and so forth. But this is the chance for Northern Ireland to build it up. And it makes it more acceptable as well if Northern Ireland creates it and the people are building it up rather than superimposed either from the EU or from UK or anywhere else. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, and just finally, 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 because <laughs> William just reminded me of something there. See the fact that we are uh, staying within the EU regulations, um, and and, and we also we're trying to introduce our own policy. It's the case that when we're staying within the EU regulations, the couple can pay payments can only can only have a cap of thirteen percent of the overall budget. So, I think there are questions around. So, the the couple payments issues is to do with the World Trade Organization. Um, agreement on agriculture that uh, Mary was just talking about, and that's still there's still going to be a limit to what called the amber box, and that's where there's been a lot of tensions between the Welsh government and the UK around the fact that in the previous version of the bill it was going to be the Secretary of State in DEFRA, so it was going to be able to say this is blue box, this is green box, this is amber box, and you're going to have limits on each of these. Um, so there is a lot of like we know that DEFRA is anti a lot of couple payments and wants to move away from a lot of these. So there's a question of how much centralization you have there and how much are the devolved administration able to 
use quite a lot of the UK Ember box because if England is not going to use it, can the rest of the UK actually use it? Or will um, the other, like the three other administrations, be kept on the same, like very little Ember box and very little coupled payment policy? And that's still very much for discussion. It's in, it's in the, the Ag Bill that the Secretary of State can determine those specific levels. So they can determine the level for the Amber Box UK as a whole, which can be lower than that required internationally, but that they can also set ones for each of the, the developed administrations as well. There is a bit in the protocol the correct effects, uh, within Article 10 on state aid that links into previous spending by Northern Ireland as well, so it's two elements. Good. Listen, really, thank you very much for that. We're, um very appreciative, very detailed, and very interesting. Um, and uh, this is a safe trip to wherever you go back. I understand you're going back to lecture in Queen's now, Mary, for two o'clock. Is uh, that right? Yes, yeah, so yeah. pretty yeah. fantastic. So, uh, well. Let's just, let just get on the move there, okay? Thanks, thank thanks you very, very much. much for very happy for very much. Okay, um, right. okay, members that. That okay, we'll deal with the table data from the Minister in connection with the motion to okay. And we've, we've already looked at that earlier, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to refer members to page four four five. Um each item of correspondence has an action against it. Are members okay to uh, with the actions against it in page four four five? Three. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to the table data from the Minister. Uh, we already have uh, read it. And, um, yes, members, I have had verbal confirmation from DERA that the revoking SRs will be laid by the end of February within the next two weeks. That's verbal confirmation on that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, we have a proposal to not move the, or that the committee does not move the motions. I propose that. Yeah. Okay. Do you need a second? No, you don't. You don't need a second. Okay. Um, okay. Members will know that normally a statutory rule will be preceded by SL one to allow com committee time to consider the, the policy merits. However, in the past, previous committees have agreed to waive the SL one stage for extraordinary emergency situations such as severe weather payments to ensure that the two C SRs are known by ministers. Quickly, so as can suggest that we agree to waive the SL one stage in, in this one specific case. Yeah. Do you want to vote on whether you want to um, not sorry. move the motion? First? I can't hear as quickly as you can. Oh, sorry. Read. <laughs> do, you, do you want to? Move it's all that. <laughs> I don't want to take a, a vote on, on this. Do we need to vote on the motion? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do, unless you do, you want to? Do you want to? Are you clear? Do you want to move the motion or not? No. No. We've been told that this could be moved in March. Closed session. John. I haven't a clue. Hmm. Not move, I think. Not move. Okay. Vote proposed not to move the motion. Okay. Hey, Rosemary. Not to move. Claire. Sorry, not to move. Not to move. No. Okay, sorry, Philip. Not move. Not move. Not move. John A. Not move. Not move. Morris. Not move. William. Well, that's okay. unanimous that you're not moving the motion. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, forward work program. Um, page four, 490 to 493 uh, in your pack. Um, Clark, uh, uh, Stella, could you brief the committee, yeah. please? Very quickly. Um, you'll be meeting um, practically all day next week. Um, or sorry, all day next Thursday, the 20th, on the agricultural bill. Um, the, the evidence session with the lags, uh, there's only one lag coming now, so we're trying to move it earlier in the day. So we might get away around about 4 o'clock. The week after that, the 27th of February, there will be an all-day meeting on the UK Environment Bill. That day, you will start early as well at 9.30. That is the day that provisionally you're down to get the tablets, or so you'll have had the tablets beforehand, hopefully. But you're to come to the committee meeting here to be to get linked into the systems and to be trained on how to use access the pack and everything. So that's why it's down there for a 9.30 start. Well, they're improving on the last half. <laughs> We've got a half an hour training before we go live. <laughs> no, I don't want to have paper packs as well, just in case. Um, and then on Thursday the 5th, an all-day meeting, which we haven't got the details finalised yet, on the fisheries bill. And then the, the last two weeks after that, the middle two weeks of March, will just be committee meetings 
to consider the evidence you've taken and decide on what your position is. And um, you may then we may then have the second of April to do something that we, we that the committee particularly wants to do before we <laughs> fun, fun fun time. <laughs> Okay. So that's just as quick as you can, and then just right. that. Well, okay, one of the potential witnesses for the environment session on the 27th of February is an expert on the environment uh, from Sheffield University, and the committee will be required to pay flights and expenses uh, for this person coming over. Are members happy for the committee to cover yeah, travel and cost? Yeah. Okay, no. thank you. Take agreement for the forward work programme? Yep. 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 Members, any other business they want to raise? Okay, the time of the next meeting is Thursday 20th at 10am. Meeting adjourned. adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.